Welcome to Into the West, Middle Earth SPG podcast. I'm Charles. With me today are Ian, Richard, and special guest, back again, Andrew. And this is a highly anticipated episode. We'll be reviewing the new FAQ that just dropped today, February 2024. Richard has a background prepared for it. Ooh, looks like Christmas came early. I guess we'll just uh, dive right in and we'll go over... Uh, some of the major changes, and then also some of the smaller clarifications and changes, and we'll share our thoughts. What do you guys think of uh, this? the timing of this FAQ, just before we dive in? Any they thoughts? Really, all the memes? They really made us wait, huh? <laughs> FAQ is like eight days off schedule, and everybody's losing their fucking minds. It's great. Dead Love game! It. It's so good. <laughs> I, I don't usually like lose my cool I, I was losing it i was like so mad that it wasn't out yet it's like it's supposed to be on a specific schedule we all know what we wanted you know included in this faq and uh I, I don't know i was sitting around waiting for it so i was so excited when it dropped this morning yeah definitely all right so to kick off probably the biggest change of this faq the dragon emperor rune it's gone from 170 points to 200 points so what I liked about this is that it's almost universal that people wanted this model nerfed. It, it's quite rare. I, even some of the Dragon Emperor players that I've talked to, they're probably like, yeah, this is probably the right move. But a question for you guys is, do you guys think this is the right kind of nerf for the Dragon Emperor? I think it's a nice start. <laughs> like, I... I, I've been mulling over this like all day, right? Like changing, like upping him by 30 points. All that does is like balances out the some of the bonuses you get in the Legion. He's still a really good profile. So all it means is it just discourages people a little bit more from taking him in like funky alliances and just kind of reinforces that they'll, if you're going to play him, you play him in the Legion, even though he's still really great outside of it. And also like realistically in the Legion, you lose three models. So your break point goes down by two. If you, for some reason, were wanting, if you want to drop like war equipment and or like downgrade a couple of cataphracts, then it changes your breakpoint by one. That's not a very big difference. So I still think the Legion is going to be pretty oppressive. Yeah, I think I have like two takes on it. I think the first is, I don't know if you guys have the same reaction as me. I saw the headline. I saw Dragon Emperor 200 points and I was skipping through the hall. Like I was so excited. Then the more I thought about it, I was like, I'm not sure that was really the best way to go about kind of addressing the issue for some of the reasons that Ian mentioned. Let me know if you guys have. I've never once seen him in an allied list. I've run him in an allied list with with some Condis chariots for like more of a, I thought it was pretty strong, but you know, not trying to win a huge tournament type of list. I've never seen him allied in previously. And I think it's because of how strong he is in the Legion. And I think now at 200 points, you have a 30 point tax to where he was before when no one was taking him in alliances. And then you want him for the fight five troops, right? So the opportunity cost of each of those troops is two additional points. So let's say you take just five of them, right? To get the fight five, it's a 40 point tax in a, in a green alliance or yellow alliance compared to what it was before. And it could be higher, right? If you take cataphracts, it's higher, right? So I was somebody who was really trying to make him work in green alliances, particularly with Mordor. As you guys know, the viewers don't, I guess that was my runner up army for Clash last year was Witch King, Dragon Emperor and Bro Gear with the drum and a ton of fight six, some terror wall. I kind of disagree a little bit with Ian, and I've heard that a lot. It's like, oh, you lose three models. So why I think it's a bigger deal than some people realize is if your meta is only 800 points and above, like totally agree. Like it's not, not going to make a meaningful difference. You're still going to have just as many troops as your opponent. You're going to beat them in every fight. You're going to re-roll. The heroes get the free re-rolls. I don't think that changes. But I do think like as somebody who plays, you know, in a meta where it's more like 600 to 700, I think you really feel it. Like I, I wrote up a list, you'd be kind of like low 30s, I think, uh, at 650, which is my most common point size. Now it's like 27 if you want to take Acolytes, which I think is kind of what most people are doing now. So that's a big difference. Like 27 is very low for, for 650. So I really like it for that because that feels about right. 
if you want to have an elite army with amazing troops that all have fight five and win every fight, like it feels like you should be at a numbers disadvantage. And to me, that was always the biggest problem with the list was that you had a numbers advantage. Typically, sometimes you were flat, but you usually had an advantage. And then on top of that, you have the best fighting troops in the game. So I have more to say, but what do you guys think of that? I think this nerf was a step in the right direction. I think it prevents this legion from just dominating the meta and like in our top armies of the gbhl 2023 video it was dominating tournaments all of last year so i think it'll tone it down a little bit there i would have liked if the legion also got like a second minor nerf like as we previously suggested and maybe remove the cataphract from the list or maybe make the instead of free dr black dragons you pay one point or something like that just so that there is a reason to go pure or play alliances and you're just not you're not just defaulting to the to the legendary legion whenever you want to play this profile that makes the list also a lot more interesting so besides uh, balancing for competitive play also makes the easterlings more interesting to to, to army build I agree with all you guys that it could have been done better, but I think I am happy that um, we can still say it's a good army. And in a sense, that's a good thing because you don't always want to see like whenever the nerf hammer comes, they go from like OP top tier army and then to unplayable, right? Like a Rangers of Athelion. So it's like, it's kind of nice. It's they're still in the mix. A bit of a side note, but I feel like there's been a lot of elves of late, especially the fight six armies, just trying to counter this army. So I wonder if there's going to be a change of thought of do we need as many like fight five, fight six, like constantly, you know, because that's been kind of the, I guess, like counter meta there. Maybe I think el well, elves are always like they're, they're they've always been like a fairly popular like list or like allied in, but you still have like Bayornings running around pretty consistently, right? And that's another non-elf fight five list that's probably going to be hanging about still for a while. So maybe a little bit, but I think it's, I don't know if we're going to go down to levels of elves like pre these two legions, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's still going to be like a net increase of those armies showing up. Yeah, you've, you've still got like half trolls. You've still got fight five minus Tirith. It might be a little less popular, but we'll, we'll just have to see exactly uh, how much it impacts. I think the the one idea that I had, and I want to get your guys' thought on this, because I totally hear you on the Black Dragon going from two to one. That feels like pretty easy. I think that just takes the numbers down a little bit. And I don't know if it really changes the frustration of playing against the list. Like, I think if you're a skilled player, there's only so much you can do, depending on your list build, right? There's only so much you can do. You have to fight in most scenarios eventually, and you're going to lose. Like, there's there's almost no force that can go up against it head to head and really win in combat. If you're playing Bay Ornings, if you're playing, you know, uh, guards of the Galadrim court, you're outnumbered, right? So it seems good in concept, but you have one dice, maybe two to their three, maybe four. And they also have two, you know, heroes that are fight six that can probably, you know, start to chip away at your troops. So I'm not saying they're going to get steamrolled, but that's your best case scenario and you're still outnumbered. So the thought that I had that I thought would be good to change it if they were going to do something to the profile and not the Legion is make the fight value bubble three inches instead of six. So you still have like an elite, you know, line of troops close by. The rest are fight four is still good. Your whole army's D6, but, you know, it has a little bit more counterplay, right? Because six inches of a fight value buff is like, you guys have played this Legion, right? It's, it's almost always active unless you're playing some really far flung, scenario for me that's the most frustrating part is like if you're going to give the whole battlefield re-rolls and then make basically the whole battlefield like not quite but mostly fight five to me that's like the most frustrating part to play against and then also that you just you know it has a tool for everything right you can't really take out the mount easily it's got resistant to magic you can't really you know spell them down easily you can do it it's just not easy He's got her heroic defense. He's got heroic strength. Like, it just feels like the normal things you would do to neutralize a centerpiece hero, you can't really do with him. So I, that was my thought, was shrink the fight value bubble to three inches. What do you guys think? As of, Well, I mean, obviously like, it doesn't cover the whole battlefield then, but then it also makes the player playing the Emperor have to choose even more where he wants to put him. And he's a, he is a hard model to reposition, so that becomes a lot more important. 
And then they have to figure out if they actually want to be able to use him to fight another hero or if they're content to have him just munch troops so they can get a bubble around. But then that means the opponent heroes are going to be away from him doing whatever they want. Whereas now he can go and fight enemy heroes and probably win and kill them and also buff everybody around him. So that's a good idea. At three inches, I wouldn't. I would no longer consider them a fight five army. It wouldn't cover enough of the battle line. You would have a lot of fight four. And it, it would probably um, reward positioning as well, similar to Thranduil. It's uh, with the palace guard. You can't just, um, you know, stay in the back line and then, oh, my whole battle line gets it. So I, I do like that. I mean, there's still a chance, right? We've seen legions get hit with the double nerf February and then August. <laughs> would right. you guys be happy if that was it or if they would you like still hope that he gets like a hit like that or the the point strike uh, value to the black dragons in august like if nothing else happens are we all like content with this or i'm happy that something's happened at you least you kind of have to yes yeah, see like how it rolls out um sometimes maybe the three models is like will end up being a big difference maker and i also noticed that sometimes it's a psychological thing when something gets nerfed because they've seen it being at its best, they don't really want to play like the nerfed down version, you know, similar to like the iron Hills ballista. I still think that's like pretty decent, but there was a huge drop off when it increased to 125, right? Okay. So the next major change is more of a rules clarification for two types of rules that were clarified. So the first one is um, control zones, which is, if you start your move within an enemy's control zone, can you leave it and charge another model? And the FAQ says yes. Which that's how I've always played it, and I think locally that's how we've always played it. I don't know if it's been a debate at a tournament, but this one seemed pretty straightforward. Was the argument that because you started in one, you couldn't enter a new one? Is that is that what the issue was? Because like like you said, like that's the way we've always played. It hasn't been an issue. So I'm just confused why it ended up being a question. I can jump in because I'm I didn't ask the question, but I've made this mistake before and I haven't been playing the game as long as you guys have. I mixed up this rule with the one that says if you enter a control zone, you have to charge the model. So in my head, it was like. Well, if you start in the control zone, then you have to charge the model. And I don't think it says that anywhere, but I have messed that up previously. So, um, but, you know, as I started playing more competitively over the last year, year and a half, people kind of corrected me on that. And then I just changed the way I was playing. But I did have that kind of mental meshing of those two rules. So I, I had played it that way for a little bit. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to just keep in mind is that you can't move closer to that model, um, model's control zone, and then leave it again. But yeah, it, I think we all, we've all we all played it that way. Yeah. We were going to go through the smaller changes later, but since they're also related to the control zone, I'll, I'll just add it in. So in a scenario where models exit the board, can a model enter control zone and then move off? So the answer is no. Once you enter an enemy's control zone, then you must charge the model. Yeah. <laughs> Common sense, I think, there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just seems like a clarification, but I don't know. I've never had that or heard of that being an issue, but. Yeah. Sure. I guess technically, because after you charge a model, you can loop around their base. And so yeah. the argument is, can you move off the board like that? Can you move off? Yeah. 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 That's, well, yeah, because it it's as soon as any part of your base moves off now, right? So as yeah. soon as you go like one millimeter off, then you're like, oh, I'm off the board. Yeah. The other clarification is pairing off fights. I believe this one is probably the bigger of the two where there, there was an argument that was made where when you pair off a multiple combat, you have to make as many one-on-ones as possible. And this FAQ basically removed that sentence from the rule book where you don't have to have the maximum of one-on-ones. So the first game I played, Pelinor Fields Kit, I had no idea how you're supposed to pair off fights for this game. Like, I'm going to just be totally honest. What wound up happening, just like in our games now, is like just a blob of guys in the middle. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. This guy charged that guy. That guy charged this guy. I remember being confused by like two on twos and stuff. I'm like, this doesn't seem right. I went back to the rule book and read the page that explains it. And I, I don't think anything needed to be changed. Like, I think I just didn't know the rule. I went and read it. And then from that point on, I've been playing it the way that they just clarified and described. So I don't know if this is something that you guys have seen come up, but 
this is why like part of winning priority is so important, right? Is because you can determine traps. You can determine which fights happen first. You can determine who pairs off where. If a big hero gets into your big hero and you think they're going to lose, you can counter trap, right? Like that's kind of the whole purpose of the game. So I don't know if that's something that you guys were seeing, but I've been playing it that way since like my second game, basically. Yeah, how I've always played it is just remember that one side has to have one model. So it's, it has to be a one-on-one, two-on-one, three-on-one. As long as one side is one model, you're good. And it gives the person with the priority more options. But I, I believe the this debate started at last year's Nova Open, because before that, I've never seen it argued that you had to have as many one-on-ones as possible until a tournament after that Nova. But but now that that sentence is removed, it, it clarifies that we've been playing it correctly. Does removing that sentence have any consequences? Like nothing is coming to mind, but I kind of, I have this feeling that it's going to be some corner cases. And now that, that that's gone, things are going to get weird. It's getting weird. I'm I, sure some rules lawyer will find some loophole. Well, that's that's what I'm thinking, because that sentence was always like like what Charles was saying. It always to me, it meant like, yeah, like like one side has to have one model. Right. But now that that clause is gone, it kind of I feel like it opens up a can. I don't know quite what it is, but it, it opens up some possibilities. Mm. But just to offer a alternative like perspective, I know uh, some of the local guys that were at Nova last year, I think after that discussion, they kind of brought it back home here to the West Coast where I think they read it very literally and it was kind of semi-adopted in some of our events where the understanding was um, so you split off always as much one-on-ones as possible and then you can't add in any extra models there. So I'm definitely glad it's been clarified. But I do think the difference between those two styles are quite apparent because I just remember, even if it was only a couple months of me playing split off one-on-one on one-on-one combats, it just made things incredibly defensive. Like anytime, like you said, Andrew, like a big hero charges another one of your more vulnerable targets, you can almost always peel it off whether you have priority or not. So I guess, yeah, now it's just uh, learn to play a bit more protective because if your guys get charged, you're likely not going to get bailed out. I think a lot more like power is in the person with priority. Yeah. In, at least in the fight phase, it gives the person with priority a lot more choice, more of an advantage. All right. So we're going to go over the rest of the changes. And these are some of the more minor ones. And the first one is another nerf to the Dragon Emperor, a really minor one. And it is a bludgeon FAQ. If an Ent model targets a Dragon Emperor with bludgeon while he's riding his palquin. Will the Dragon Emperor be automatically dismounted? Yes. <laughs> hey, there's the second nerf, right? So we don't need to talk about the three-inch bubble or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it got a second nerf. I just love that this was written in here. Like, just because the model at every opportunity, whenever they get to answer a question of if it gets dismounted, the answer is no, right? Like, Sorcerer's Blast, no. Like charged by monstrous charm, no, like it never gets knocked over, and like, sure, like I guess I guess this makes sense as the one thing that can knock it over. Yes, that totally makes sense. But I don't know. It, it feels like they they viewed it as okay. Nobody's really playing these armies competitively, so why don't we just let them knock them over? Whereas I feel like some of the other things probably should. But it's interesting. I mean. What's trivia? Like 200 points with Marion Pippin, Yellow Alliance? Yeah. I don't think it's great, but if you, you want to go beat up on some Dragon Emperors and you can get that huge base into their huge base, then by all means. Yeah, this, this matchup was so lopsided. It took two years after the Dragon Emperor's release to have this situation come up. Someone actually got an end into the Dragon Emperor and <laughs> called this brutal power attack. Well, it's a frequently asked question, not like one person asked it. So everybody wants to know if an ant can knock them over <laughs> with the bludgeon. So we actually have a second bludgeon clarification. And the question is, 
Can an Ent model use the Bludgeon Brutal Power Attack to target a model riding a monster like Radagast? The answer is no, as that model is a monster keyword model. So you aren't able to like pick a Ringwraith off a of Felbeast and Bludgeon with him. But you can do that to the Palaquin. I love that. So we know for sure the Palaquin is not a monster then. Yeah. <laughs> so it's right. one buff and one nerf. So one buff and one nerf. Yeah. Flat. The next one is uh the only clarification in the match play guide. In the fog of war scenario, do players secretly write their objectives down before or after deployment? And it is after both sides have been deployed. So I've actually seen this asked before where some people played it before you deploy and some people played it after. I, I've seen it ruled, ruled both ways. So what do you guys think of this one? Is this how you've always played it? I think I've always played it that you pick them before you deploy. Um, Cause then there's like, like there's the emphasis on deployment where it's like, Oh, do I want to give away what I'm trying to do? Or do I want to hide? Do I want to hide? But then you could also end up in the scenario where it's like you picked that hero that you wanted to kill, and then they're just like you can see your opponent just go ha, 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 and put him like in the back corner of the board, and like cool, I'm never getting him. Which that kind of sucked. I think it just it changes the shit like the dynamics of how you pick and the emphasis on deployment. Like deployment was still important before in the scenario, but in a different way. Now it's also important, but it it kind of it matters on what you want to like limit your opponent to do. Is that there's more emphasis on that. Like you, you want to like really limit your vulnerabilities when you're putting down your models. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with Ian. I like it. I played the same way, but I think now there's no incentive to be like cheesy in your deployment and like just hide a hero in the back. There's double points, right? It's the assassinate target and defend. So if you're defending one of your small heroes, you can already just guarantee points right there. So it's a little bit harder to do that. <clears throat> you can't double dip on that or there's no chance because if you hide one of your he small heroes, then you know for sure your opponent is not going to choose them, right? So is there is some <laughs> benefit to that though. <laughs> uh, yeah, but overall, I think I like, I like the clarification. Yeah, so I've always played it as before deployment as well. And I kind of like that. I feel like this actually takes a little bit of the mind games out of, you know, the scenario. This is my favorite scenario, as you guys know. I don't think that changes with this. You might have some scenarios where you have like a leg a lot on one side of the board and you're forced to kind of deploy, you know, normally because you can't hide everyone. And there's going to be an easy target for your opponent to pick in that situation. I know that's corner case, but also like, a black dart or you know something where you can you can pick off a troop obviously those are good in the scenario anyway but just to provide one counterpoint like i think it's going to be more straightforward and my favorite part of the scenario is like i have no idea what's going on like but that's also part of the gamesmanship like ian said right maybe you deploy a squishy target up front and you're like yeah go ahead and pick it because i'm you know defending somebody else or whatever right like i guess it doesn't totally change it but i feel like it makes deployment in that scenario extremely important. If you don't deploy well, you might, I don't want to say lose the game before it starts, but you could, right? Depending on what's on the other side of the board. I think this is one that I haven't heard anyone talk about that I actually think has some pretty big impact though. What about picking your secret targets during deployment? Because I've been, I've been doing that a little bit too. When, when, when my opponent suggests it while we're deploying and I'm just like, sure, let's pick while, while I'm putting down my war band. That's, that's <laughs> definitely incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest difference is probably which terrain piece you're going to pick. Cause like before you like, I think I agree with that. I think there's a lot of thinking you had to do about it, but now once you know where everything is deployed, you like, it's much easier for you to like, to see where you think you'll be like it'll be much easier for you to overrun and like get models too. Like I think if you play it the, the way that we were playing before, like everybody's had a round of this where you like you pick a piece and then your opponent puts like their entire army on that and you're like, fuck. <laughs> but I kind of like I'm gonna miss that. You know what I mean? Like uh fog was the last round of clash, right? As you guys know. And um to me it's it's a perfect scenario to end any tournament. I know it was just a random roll in the pool of three, but like I think it's one of the most skill intensive scenarios. And I do think that this limits it a bit because 
let's say one army is all infantry, right? Or mostly infantry. And the other has all the mobility with like a spider queen or something like that. Sure, you might get the objectives anyway, but there's that chance, like you said, Ian, hey, maybe they pick this piece and I'm just going to bunker down on this piece and that's the one I'm going to protect and that's the one I'm going to try to deny them. The games are going to be much more straightforward, I think, with this rule. So I'm not saying I hate it, but I, I do think it it is a pretty big change in my opinion. All right, so the next one is another one related to exiting the board. So can a model exit the board via other means other than movement? So backing away, being compelled off the board, being hurled off the board by a siege engine? The answer is no. A model can only leave the board via their own movement. I'm just picturing a guy, right, who's like about to get off the board in recon, and you're just like, crap, like shoot it with the Iron Hills Ballista, right? And and he gets hit, he survives, and then he just hits an invisible wall and can't, and can't leave. Like, I don't know why. I think it's so funny. I don't think it has, this has never come up in a game that I've played. So I don't know. Yeah, think I, think, I think it makes sense because when you are fighting on a table edge and you lose a fight, you count as trapped, right? If you're if you're base to base with the board edge and you can't back away, so it makes sense that it's an invisible wall. Yeah, I agree. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Next one. If a model has its melee weapons shattered by the shatter of magical power, but still has range weapons, does it count as unarmed? Yes. So you can't fight with range weapons. I think this is a holdover from like ten years ago where there was a special thing that orc bows had where they said it counted as a hand weapon. They were called bladed bows <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the only reason this has come up as a question. I mean, fair enough, I guess, but yeah, okay. Yeah, so range weapons, shooting only. I guess the only uh, exception is like maybe Rohan models in one of the legendary legions, because I know you can't fight with throwing weapons either. Because with that special rule, they can support. So they act like a spear, right? So I can see that working, but normal throwing weapons, no. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Yeah, because there yeah. was another clarification whether Iron Guard could piercing strike because they have throwing axes and the clarification was no, right? Because if it's yeah. the same, it's it would be the same logic because they can't fight with their throwing weapons in combat. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it's a corner case. Like, who, whoever is going to, like, shatter a Rohan troops weapon in while they're in a legion? What if they shatter, like, Theodred's sword and you have the throwing spear left? I mean, he could support with the spear, I think, with one attack. Or he could charge in at minus one and still reroll all his failed wounds, which I think you probably do. <laughs> but yeah, that's fair enough. I guess, I guess the Rohan. I forgot the Rohan heroes. So this is the long-awaited nerf to Theodra that everybody's been waiting for. So no more comments once everybody realizes he's OP, okay? Because he's been nerfed. <laughs> All right, the next one is, if a cavalry model has the fortified spirit magical power cast on them, can the mount also gain the benefits if they're targeted separately by an enemy magical power? Yes. Yeah, it's one model. Yeah. Okay. This is one is also weapons related. If a model has two weapons, such as a dragon called Acolyte or a Corsair Reaver, and they want to swap for a different type of weapon and pay one point, can they swap just one and then be able to use two special strikes, essentially? And the answer is no. So if you want to pay points to swap your weapon, you have to swap both of them. Third nerf to the Dragon Legion. Can't can't get those axes that easily on those acolytes. Well, well, it's just no more double dipping. I mean, not that. I mean, was that much of an issue anyway? I, mean, I think you still get the piercing Maybe. strike. You just can't piercing yeah. strike or faint. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, sure. Minor, minor nerf to the Easter links. <laughs> you can't. You can't like. stab to kill your own acolytes to end the game. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this one is an interesting one. Can a model be deployed in or on a piece of terrain that would make them impossible to reach 
during the course of the game, such as a pillar, sheer cliff, or building with no way to climb? The answer is no. I feel like I do this all the time. So I'm going to have to change. Yeah, that. like on top of a ruin or something, right? There's like a, like in one of the ruin sets, there, there's just like a wooden plank and there's no stairs going up. The funny thing is that this is kind of like a good thing yes. when it happens. Like the times that I've seen like some player put like Legolas in a place that he can't come down from or you yeah. can't get to him. I'm kind of like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. 800, 100 points for like, you know, almost a guaranteed shot, but like one shot every turn. It's like fine. <laughs> yeah. It's such a I, trap. <laughs> I've never really encountered this as much of as a problem because even if they put people in a building, usually we just say, oh, you can climb the side of the building as normal. Sure. Why not? And then it's the same thing that Richard is saying. It's like the only people who usually do that are people who are pretty new to the game and they put like an entire war band up there and you're like, cool. Yeah. 200 points I don't have to deal with. But there's one thing that I think where the, this clarification is good is when like one of those edges, one of those cliffs or something is close to an objective, like in domination or something. And you can just park like an archer on top of the objective and there wouldn't be any way to get rid of them unless you shoot them. In those situations, it's, it's like a really easy and defendable objective. So siege edges probably benefit the most out of it, the, or sorry, Get the worst out of it, not the best. Because <laughs> before, yeah, if you could just park them up on some place, like, ah, oh, you can't climb that, but I'm just going to sit here and fling rocks at you all day. I mean, it's rare that that happened, but, you know, I guess that's probably the biggest effect. I feel like I've seen spiders also deployed, like, in very difficult-to-reach places, right? Because they can just free move. But what's interesting about this one to me is that the way it reads is it says a piece of terrain that would make it impossible for other models to reach them. So I think like if your opponent's got like a pre-bane, then I think you can deploy there, right? Like if, if, if they have a pre-bane and it has enough space to land, I think you can deploy there. It just says it has to be impossible for other models to reach that, that it wouldn't be impossible, right? Or if your opponent's playing any spiders, you can just put models wherever you want, right? I don't think that's the intent, but that's how I read it. I agree. It's not the intent, but I don't think you're wrong because technically somebody could argue that. Like, it's like the same thing. Like, if you're the spider player, you couldn't deploy your models on that impossible terrain piece. Turn one, you can move them onto that, but you can't deploy them there. Start them there. This is, it's a weird rule. Okay. I don't know how I feel about that now. <laughs> yeah. The impossible for other models. Like, what does other models mean, right? What if your opponent just has a Moomac? then would you not be able to deploy in any sort of choke point that a Moomac can't move through? Because you, the other models on the on your opponent's army, none of them can reach you. But a choke point isn't a terrain piece. It's a space that is devoid of terrain between two terrain pieces. Let's rules lawyer this more. Let's, this is the stupid FAQ. Why is it here? <laughs> it's just making problems. Why did they do this? I think what it's supposed to say, which is like what I play now, is like even if you have a bridge, if you have a building, is you just agree with your opponent before the game starts on what it is and you agree that there's some way to access it or you don't use yeah. it. Right? I, I think yeah. that's what this is yeah. trying to say, right? And that's how I play it is yeah. there's was, there was a matchup at this tourney in New Jersey, like in the summer last year. There's this huge bridge. I deployed all my archers up there because it was a scenario where I could just sit back and shoot. And we said there'd be a ladder right in front of it. It'd be like six inches. So one move and you could get that in the ladder, right? And that was how we fixed it. And there was no problem. I think that's what it's trying to say. They also specifically reference like pillars, cliffs, or buildings, right? So I think it is supposed to be places that would be hard to reach. We just went through all the changes of the most recent FAQ update. Overall, it was pretty solid. A short one, but not bad. I haven't been playing the game for as long as you guys have, but I honestly feel like they usually get it right. Like, I feel like I'm usually happy with what they do. Like, I thought the changes to Assault on Lothlorien last year, you still see it. It's still good, but it's not as impressive as it was before. Like, I feel like they do a pretty good job, honestly. We haven't talked about 
the most important topic yet that if you allow me to, I will talk about for hours and hours and hours, which is that this FAQ was great because they didn't nerf models that people have been complaining about consistently that in my view have no business being nerfed, which is the Witch King and Sulatan. So I actually think that was the best thing about this FAQ update. Um, I don't understand really why anyone would think those models need to be nerfed. Are they like excellent? Yes. Every game needs to have excellent models. Um, but I think both of them have pretty clear ways to counter them. And the Dragon Emperor has no real clear way to counter it. So I don't know if you guys want to say anything on that, but I felt pretty strongly that if either one of those models showed up as a nerf in points or anything, I'd be pretty frustrated by that. So I was very happy that they didn't do that. If you go back to our uh, top 10 armies of 2023, I think a lot of people saw those stats. Also, like they were publicly available in the GBHL, but um, just how many like podium events the Witch King and Soledad Alliance won. But I think one of the stats that wasn't really recorded that I think makes your argument, Andrew, is how prevalent they are, right? I, I think there's a lot more people running the Witch King and Soledad compared to the Dragon Emperor. So even though the Dragon Emperor only came in th third podium wise, I have a feeling that like... They're just not as many people play it because of the price and maybe like a more like off theme. But the win percentage, I would like to say, is probably much higher. There's a meme for the uh, the Suladan issue, at least. I'll see. Maybe we can find it and put it up at the end here. But I think it perfectly encapsulates the uh, Suladan's weaknesses that are very, very obvious. So... Before we end the episode, I just want to mention the sponsor for this video, Baron of Dice. They make nice looking dice for a wide range of games, including Middle Earth SVG. You can use our promo code WEST for 5% off. Go check out their dice on the website. And I also want to say a quick thank you to our patrons over on Patreon. Thank you for supporting us. And if you're interested in extra content and seeing videos early and other perks, please go check it out in the link below. Thanks, Andrew, for joining us to talk about this FAQ. Look forward to the next episode of Into the West.